It's like, it's like, and that's what's holding it up. Yeah, and it's sitting on its job. Hey, maniacs. Hey, mystery maniacs. Yes. Poirot Maniacs. Poirot Maniacs. Mystery Maniacs is a comedy recap podcast dedicated to mystery TV. Each week we dig into an episode of the show, including the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. This week, Poirot, season one, episode two, murder. Not really. In the muse. I'm Sarah. Kind of, sort of. And your Mark. Hey, we're going to spoil it. If you haven't seen or read Murder in the Muse and you don't know what happened, stop now. I forgot. We're going to give it away. The ending to this episode, but I was like, oh, Plunderleth did it. She's so <laughs> guilty. <laughs> well, there's there's only so many characters. Yeah. You know, the process of elimination kind of narrows it down. But a we'll bit. get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah, we're back in Poirot land. Last week you had the remix of the... Clap him cook. With our special interview with Poirot. Which I don't think anybody appreciated. A couple, pe- <laughs> couple of people said some nice things. Said it was funny. I thought it was funny. It took a lot of work. It, it was like <laughs> one of those old DJ bits where we took recordings of Poirot. And, yeah. Now, see, people would just do it with AI and they would just imitate Poirot's voice. And I don't want a Poirot AI. I don't either. He'd be so bossy. He would be. Be brilliant, but bossy. And... Actually, like episode one, we see a lot of this is what Poirot's personality is Mm -hmm. scenes in this episode. Yeah, though, I really like that. This this episode, Murder in the Muse, has some of the wittiest one liners and wittiest conversations between all the characters. I I think, yeah, it's one of my favorites, not because of the case, but just because I love the characters. And they pack so much into an hour. Yeah, a lot. It was one of those ones where I'm like, is this 90 minutes or is this an hour? No, it's an hour. Yeah. So it trundles along, though. How are you doing, by the way? Uh, I'm fighting it. I got the ill, the yeah. illness. You never get sick. I know I never get sick, but we went to a hockey game last night. I went with some people from work. I think I probably got ill there. I got the funk from the crowd at the, the hockey game. I don't I don't think you could have contracted something last night and woke up with it this morning. Well. Maybe we, staying out late. Been fighting and, uh, it, staying being out late. in the cold and, at the hockey game. It wasn't super cold, but yeah. So if you hear some gravel in his voice. It's because he's a sick boy. Or I'm sleeping. (laughs) (laughs) If you fall asleep while we're recording, I'm going to throw something at you. I would go sit in the living room with the dog, but oh my gosh, our dog has turned into another level of hellion this week. She had... She's been so good, but in the last week, she has started throwing tantrums. (laughs) I don't know how else to describe it. (laughs) When she's bad, we just walk her in the living room and we close the door to the living room. Okay. So she has a giant room with a couch and a bed. And well, she has more than one bed in there. Yeah, everything is in there for her. It's just like, no, we're not going to be near you. You're in trouble. And now when we do that, she has a tantrum. She trashes the couch, throws the cushions all over the floor, headbutts the recycling bin into the side of the dryer over and over and over again. (laughs) And then barks at it over and over again. I'm waiting for her to throw herself on the floor and roll around. Ah! And then you look at her and she blinks at you. It's like, like, what? What? I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. I, apparently last night while I was at the, at the hockey game, she threw a full on fit because somebody had a flashlight. She absolutely threw a tantrum. Like I couldn't hold her. She was flailing around so much and, and screaming. Screaming. It wasn't barking. She was screaming. She's just rotten to the so core. So our dog is going through the terrible twos. Two and a half. Yeah. It's. I think she's just terrible olive. I think it's just who she is. <laughs> you can't screen them for personality. No. I wish you could. Well, <laughs> definitely wish you could. <laughs> Maybe she'll grow out of it. Uh, somebody emailed and said, you just need to be stern with her. Yeah. Like if you'd ever met her, you'd know it doesn't work. 
I can scream at her. I can put my finger at her and use the stern voice. Bad dog, bad dog. And she just tries to bite my hand. Yeah, she doesn't. We spell it B A D D O G. <laughs> she doesn't respond to stern voice no. at all. She doesn't respect us as a pack at all. No. She's just the olive yeah. doing the olive things. <laughs> And we, yet, I'll and go in there her. this afternoon, and she'll curl up in my lap and yeah. be like, where uh, were you? Yeah. Anyhow. So, so another thing making the rounds of the mystery Twitters and Instagrams is this weird little tea lunch thing quiz. So I thought we'd do it. So this is, you've given me a picture of this. Yes. It has a row of teas of various shades. Yes. A row of tea sandwiches and yes. a row of dessert tea things. So. And the, you're supposed to choose something from each one? Choose one from each level. Hmm. Well, I'm a builder's tea girl. Okay. I have to say, I drink black tea with sweetened condensed milk in it. Yes. Which is an anathema to half of the world. Strangely, exactly like my father did. Which I did not know. Yep. So I would go somewhere between B and C for my tea. Okay. Pretty creamy. Okay. Not too strong. Somewhat for, sweet. For me, uh, it's dirty water. You don't like tea at all. No. You don't drink iced filth. tea or anything. Oh my God. Well. Or you, you're going to post this with the episode, right? So yeah, people will I'll, be able I'll to post see. this with the episode in the show notes so you can see what we're talking about. So with the sandwiches, we have a choice of ham and cheese, egg and crust, smoked salmon, BLT, tuna mayo, or prawn mayo. You okay? Are you okay? Are you eating too much mayo? I'm a little worried about how much mayo you're eating. <laughs> yeah. Now, egg, egg and crust egg, has mayo, smoked salmon has mayo, tuna mayo, prawn mayo, certainly. Yeah. And BLT probably has mayo on mm, it. And most people put mayo on a ham and cheese, <sighs> though not... Mark cannot stand mayo. It's... Like, not even the sight of it. It's egg cold soup. No, it's not. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's good. It's emulsified egg fat. <laughs> <laughs> and sick just thinking some of it. the things that you eat and you won't touch mayo no. i i will choose from that um the blt i think that okay. sounds good but i'll I, take the but, ham and cheese but That's i would eat any of those except the smoked salmon i'm not really into smoked salmon no no for the dessert, what about wa water? Uh, egg it, and cress? Yeah, I, I would. That's egg salad. Yeah, I would eat that. Yeah. For the desserts, we have a scone with jam and cream. Notice the cream is on top of the jam in this picture. Yes. Half of the, half of the UK would reject that. Yes, by the way. immediately right away. Carrot cake, Victoria sponge, macarons. Yes. Not macaroons. No nope. macaron. Uh, lemon drizzle cake or profiteroles, which okay. are basically cream puffs. I'm just gonna go and state this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I know people are going to be upset about this, but vegetables are not dessert. I would eat one of each of those. No. I would eat all of those at the same time. Much like Put them on a plate. potato pie, vegetables are not dessert. Carrot cake is good. No, it's not. You're just all fooling it's yourself. It's spice cake. Yes, it's spice cake that you're like, oh, we'll put vegetables in. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I don't know what the origin of carrot cake is. I don't know if it was a spice cake during a time when people were short on ingredients and they added the carrot to bulk it up, or if it's actually there for flavor. No, somebody was making a spice like cake it. and a, a, a carrot, carrot fell accidentally in. fell into it. A pre-shredded carrot. somebody said, oh, that's not horrible. Just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> when really it was horrible. I would eat all those things. I will and then admit. The thing I hate about the carrot cake the most <laughs> okay. in this picture is the fact that they have a carrot made of icing on the top of it. Mm -hmm. Why That's not so just, that you know what it is? No, oh, because it could be a spice Vegetables cake. Vegetables are not dessert, and Victoria sponge cake is the best of those. Of all of these, uh, the macarons are the only ones I can't make. And the per yes. I can't. I've tried to yep. make macarons. I cannot make a macaron. Sarah makes fantastic desserts. The profiteroles in this picture look weird. I know what they're supposed to be, but it looks more like a bagel with brown cream cheese on it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it looks tasty. But the, the Victoria sponge, certainly. Two level of tastiness. And the macaroons are like, they're pretty, but I don't know how good they are. Aren't they coconutty? No, they're yeah. more meringue. Again, crunchy meringue. I would remind you, coconut is a vegetable. It's a nut. <laughs> Hence the nut. Should not be in desserts. Well, we've done it now. We've answered the quiz. Yep. A lot of other people have answered the quiz. There's also a rather 
a lively discussion on the Midsummer Murders subreddit about how to make the cakes that the rainbirds eat. Yes. Somebody posted the ice sombrero recipe, which is yeah. awesome. And there's a discussion about what that little sailboat cake is. Yeah. Uh, that, the, all that is fantastically maniacal. <laughs> By the way, we're very close to 5,000 uh, individuals, members on the uh, Reddit subreddit. The Midsummer subreddit. subreddit. So when I took over, there were 1,100. I checked this users on that subreddit and we've grown that subreddit to 5,000 in less than three years. It's fun. It's, there are a lot of great people on there now and it is none of the bad stuff of Reddit because Reddit is like the internet. There is a vast majority of good stuff and a bunch of bad stuff that gets there's pressed. a little, there's a few little cesspits here and there that, that you don't have press. to, but you don't have to notice it no. at all. You don't have to go there at all. Are you ready to talk about the murder in the muse? It's not a murder in the muse. It's not a murder, and it doesn't really happen in the muse. <laughs> what, do, what is a muse? It, a parking lot? Kind of. A row or street of houses or apartments that have been converted from stables or built to look like former stables. Mm -hmm. So I went online and looked for muse houses that were for sale in London. Yeah. And most of them have a garage on the ground floor and the front door of the apartment or the house is next to a big garage door. So it's clear that they were built with the emphasis on the, the garage. garage, right? And sometimes there's steps up to the front door. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now in this case, Hastings has his car parked in this muse. He must rent a garage. He, he in rents this muse. a garage because somebody doesn't need the garage because they don't have a car or a horse. This is Bardsley Garden Muse, which is made up. The plot of this one is pretty simple. Yes. Girl kills herself. Her roommate makes it look like a murder to frame a guy she doesn't like who's been blackmailing the roommate. Straightforward. Yep. And we have a, a great... It is the least important part of this episode. Oh, Everything else is fabulous. so much other great stuff in this episode. Starting with, it's the 5th of November. It's Guy Fox night. It's Guy Fox night. Now, let me ask you before we get into it, Guy Fox. Yes. Bad guy or good guy? Okay, he was going to kill people. Okay, so you say he's a bad guy? I don't care what your political philosophy is. If you're going to kill people who are innocent, right? They were just sitting above all the gunpowder. <laughs> And you may not think they were innocent, but... But he didn't. Yeah, there's all sorts of things about, like, did he get caught before it happened? Or what, is he running away? Or It's one of those great, if I had a time machine, I'd go back and watch that night. Pre-1980s, he was uniformly a bad guy. He yep. was a papist traitor. Yeah. Everybody hated him. Burn effigies of him. Post-1980s, post-V for Vendetta, he is now a symbol of, of riot and rebellion against oppressors. Yeah. and He has become something completely different than, than that historical character. And what, what's interesting is V for Vendetta, the comic book, and not to get too nerdy here, uh, V for D Vendetta, the comic book, which was created by Alan Moore, who wrote it. Uh, that appeared in periodical form in the UK and then uh, it was became serialized. a graphic, graphic novel here mm -hmm. in uh, the United States. A brilliant piece of comic work, absolute brilliant piece of comic work, has none of that in it. It is an exploration of anarchy. Yes, but I think it's ironic that they celebrate Guy Fox with fireworks. Yes. <laughs> they should celebrate it with a bunch of fireworks that don't go off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like... Oh, Let's we build it. a big pile of stuff that won't that, burn. That won't burn. No matter what we do, it won't burn. And somebody comes and takes it away and arrests us. No. You know what you don't want to do? You don't want to look up sparklers' history because all you get is how dangerous sparklers are. <laughs> You'll put your eye out, kid. No. You'll burn your hands. Like, really? They're dangerous? You're lighting gunpowder and magnesium up a light? On a stick and then uh, handing it to a kid? Uh, like, and telling them to wave it around at other kids? But it's also a lot of fun. They are fun. Have you ever yeah. had the really big ones? Yeah. They're like three feet long. They burn for like an hour and a half, and you're so bored by the time yeah. it's done. You're like, oh, God. It's still no, going. It's still going. Where are... Uh, like, okay. So, so Jap, Jap, Hastings, and Poirot are walking on Guy Fox night in the dark, past the muse, past the sparklers and the fireworks. And that's how we open. And Jap, um, 
Hastings says the most writerly thing ever here. I wonder what would happen if there was murder on this night to disguise it. That's totally Agatha Christie talking through Hastings. Yeah. Like that may have been why she wrote the story. Was yeah. She had that thought too. Fireworks are a great cover for a gunshot. Where were they before? Where are they coming from? Yes. I think they've been out to dinner. That's what I'm going to say. I think so. And what I really like here is they do such a good job of being friendly with each other. Like these men who are actors Mm -hmm. barely know each other Mm -hmm. at this point in time. Like they've gone through rehearsals, yes, and they went through the filming of one episode. But they're not best buds. No. But they... uh, come off very friendly to each other. Here. And they could not be more different yes. from each other. They have completely different backgrounds. And yet I, I like these episodes where Jap and Poirot are friends so much better than some of the ones where they're like um, opposing, where Jap is like, get out of here. I don't need your meddling, you know, PI or whatever. I don't like that. I like that. I like when they're buddies and they like see a case as a challenge that they can solve together. These these episodes are so good, we forget the 1989 sexism and racism <laughs> that is <laughs> rampant in these episodes. <laughs> wow, well, Mrs. Some Jeff, of it is, she doesn't like the fun. <laughs> some of it is just in the stories, too, yeah. and they just kept it. Yeah, I don't think it's sexist to say Mrs. Jap doesn't like to see other people having fun. I think that's her personality. It's not... I know. I just Sexist. don't like men that complain about their I wives. I know. Well, but he says one thing. Yeah. And it's still. And it's kind of true from what we know of her. Well, she at, sings the hymns. <laughs> at Christmas time. <laughs> in Wales. I, I love that they're jovial with each other. They're joking around. Yes, Hastings. We ever, we pull ever so gently the leg. The leg. <laughs> yeah. Because they're well. pulling us like. Because yeah. it'd be a good night for a gunshot, but not if you wanted to poison someone or, or strangle, strangle someone. someone. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't cover that up. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's so gullible. Oh, I guess you're right. Wait a minute. Are you pulling my leg? <laughs> yes. And then we get next day where Poirot is, has a scratchy collar. We'll get to it. And Hastings is just lying around reading the paper with his shoes on the couch. I don't think Poirot would let him do that. No. But I don't think Poirot would want to see his socked feet either. Better than his shoes on the couch. There are so many episodes where uh, where Hastings is just lounging around reading a paper. Oh. It's what he does. It is the, the best, the absolute best one. I forget what episode is. The, when he explains about dating the architect, he's yes. really dating his mom. Her <laughs> the mom. architect's mom. <laughs> Or when he and Miss Lemon are talking about stocks. That the, both of those are fantastic, <laughs> but and sometimes he's reading like crimes in the paper off to yes. get Poirot's attention yeah. to a case or something. But this time, yeah, they start talking about laundry. But then Poirot has a dentist appointment. We'll yeah. talk more about his teeth uh, in another episode this season. But then Jap calls and says, Poirot. There was a murder. There I'll was meet you a there. Murder. I'll meet you there in an hour. Click. Yep. And he just hangs up. Yeah. Because he knows Poirot is going to drop everything and go. And Poirot's like, oh, I can't go to that dentist appointment. Oh, now. darn. Cancel my appointments, Miss Lemon. Oh, <laughs> I got to go. Miss Lemon. <laughs> He's got urgent business. He's off. And that nice little bit where Poirot and Jap are walking towards the scene of the crime. And it's all 80 yard. Yeah. Which is additional da- uh, dialogue. dialogue recording. Because they couldn't pick up their voices when they were shooting that. Hastings doesn't go with Poirot. No. When he goes to see the crime. No. I guess he just stays on the couch reading the newspaper. I guess so. But then he's... No, no. He goes because he's there fixing the car with Freddie. That's right. That's why he doesn't go. He's already there. Yes. How does that happen? I never noticed that. So in the hour between Poirot getting the call from Jap and going to the Muse, Hastings goes, I'm going to go work on my car. Which just happens to be. At the same place. Yes. But they don't go together. Freddy the informant. Freddy Hogg is the best character in this episode. So Freddy Hogg is played by a young man named Nicholas Delve. Mm-hmm. Who's in one other show. He was, he's so good. He is so good in this. <laughs> he knows all about the car. <laughs> 
<laughs> he takes the money from Jap and asks him for some more. He totally <laughs> is the. He's like, "Hi, I'm exposition. I'm I'm a young person who is older than my years. Yeah, in, in late like early Edwardian English. <laughs> I love that um, he and Hastings are buddies because Hastings is the kind of guy who's like, "I don't care that you're ten. You know about cars. Let's do this." And like <laughs> he's observant and notices the time and yep. stuff like that. Completely trustworthy. I, apparently, I wouldn't have been surprised if we saw Freddie in other episodes. But I wish we did because I, I like him. Did. I think he should be Hastings' sidekick. So, <laughs> little Freddie, I kind of stalked Nicholas Delve, <laughs> who is Freddie. Yeah, because that's a pretty specific name yeah so and sometimes we find actors who were like they played one part and especially when they were young and then you you look them up and you find out now they're like an astrophysicist or something like they acted as a kid and then they stopped yep well nicholas delve may have become a chiropractor <laughs> you're not sure Sunderland, i think he is where his practice is don't I they call them osteopaths the, in the uk yes osteopath chiropractor i got to the point where i was staring at his picture and another picture of freddie <laughs> trying to figure out if it was him and then i wondered what i was doing with my life <laughs> He's got pretty distinctive teeth. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Stalking an osteopath. <laughs> Who seems to be too young. You think so? But then I was like, but Freddie's... 10, 12. Yeah. So so he was born in the late 70s. Yeah. So he'd be a few years younger than me. So like... So did he look like he was in his mid 40s? Yeah. He's got a wife and child. Good for him. He's I got hope, a good career. I hope it's him, and there's no mention of it. Of course not. You're on, not going to say I was once in a Poirot. And I didn't, <laughs> like, call them. Right? <laughs> you caught yourself before you went too I did, far. I didn't go that far. <laughs> but it's a unique name. That's you, the only person who has that you name. You didn't put the two pictures the into, like, into, like, AI and ask what the chances were that it was him? <laughs> no, but that's a good idea. <laughs> I might do that. You can put it in Photoshop and try to like make one transparent and try to line up the features you know, like they do on CSI. <laughs> it's him. It's him. People already think we're weird enough. Well, that's kind of the point, isn't so. it? That's what we do. This apartment is weird. Well, okay. It's weird in that it's an Art Nouveau museum. Plenderleith, yeah, and Alan have an apartment that is full of collectible, expensive art yeah. with the occasional shot of Barbara Allen that Plenderleith has taken, a black and white photo of her. Yes. That appears three places in the apartment. Yes. Like she's happy about that photo because Plenderleith is a photographer and has a little studio in the living room. So I wanted to ask, and this is not the subtle, well, not subtle racism, the overt racism and subtle misogyny of the episode, but did you kind of get a gay vibe off of her and her friend? That would be homophobia, not yeah. racism. Um mm. <laughs> Kinda. Like she has the pictures of her. She's obviously very close to her. Yeah. I maybe, and maybe that's why she's not so crazy about the fiance, though he is a dick. Yeah. We'll Sorry. get to we'll get to <laughs> um, the fiance. But I don't I don't know. I mean, no. Okay. I don't think so. I have in my notes. Though here. I will say, Plenderleaf's hair really bothers me. Oh, it's, it's like a mullet, isn't it? Is it a mullet? It's horrible hair and she wears like red look at me clothes when she's mm -hmm. trying not to be suspicious yes i think yes she's not a good liar no the character is not a good i have liar. in my notes plunderleaf clearly is the killer <laughs> when i had forgotten what happened in this episode among the things that are in the apartment that are probably valuable enough to buy the apartment <laughs> yes is a horse head oh that horse head is frightening it's on the mantle and it has the weirdest expression on its face. It's I, like it's been it's like the guys on Night Country, the scientists who have been scared by <laughs> If you haven't seen it. No, it's beyond looking scared. It looks like 
They're having a stroke. <laughs> like if you've had a stroke and your your jaw is kind of slack. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like And that's what's holding it up. Yeah, and it's sitting on its, it's jaw. We have a picture of it. We'll post the picture yeah, of it. We'll post the picture. It's got a blubbery bottom mm. lip and yeah. it, it looks like it's just been punched and freeze framed and Hello, sculpted. <laughs> I'm a horse. I'm on the mental. I'm on the horse. It's mental. probably incredibly valuable. <laughs> It's the weirdest face of a horse. It's not at all what I would choose to put on my Art Nouveau mantle in my yeah. apartment. <laughs> and I can't imagine that it's a good prop for photographs. Ooh, can I pose with the weird blubber-lipped horse? <laughs> it's my favorite. The woman who's dead is a pretty good dead body here. She is. She's good later in the reenactment of the crime, too. Yeah. Her eyes are open. Yeah. Apparently, according to the people on IMDb, her fingers move at one point, though I didn't see it. I looked right. for it, but I didn't see it. So then they go back. They find the cuff link, and then they go back outside, and Freddie gives his report without notes. That's the other part. Oh, he remembers everything. Yeah, he deserves more He's got money. his little holy sweater on, got yeah. his greasy hands. And they jump in a cab to go see Charles. Charles. Charles Laverton West, which yes. is such a poncy name. And they go into his office and I'm like, George! Yes. Same actor, David Yelland, who plays George, who is Poirot's man later. So later on... When Hastings I, is gone, he has a, I, a butler. Yeah, he has a butler because I think... They moved away from Inspector, uh, from Jap, not Jap, sorry, from Hastings and Lemon. Well, mostly because I don't think Mrs. Lemon wanted to be an actor anymore. Mm -mm. I think she, she went on to be a psychic. Yeah. And so Hastings was like out. And so they replaced him with George. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. He doesn't even get up no. when they come in to shake their hands. Well, as a politician, you'd think he would get up and shake their hands because he doesn't know what they're there for. He is there. To be like, this is how upper crest people deal with marriage and death. Mm, stiff like, upper lip. Yeah. He's a toff. That's no, what Freddie he's says. He's a boiled owl. <laughs> 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 what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> what a no, stuffed the, fish or the, a boiled owl. <laughs> the toff is Eustace. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. No, the boiled owl is, is Charles. Is Charles. What does a boiled owl look like? I I don't know. I don't want to think is about it. Is that a too common much. phrase? Yeah. Okay. And Charles's first reaction is to worry about whether the press have picked it up or not. Yes. He's so selfish. But the PM's on the phone. But apparently Barbara really loved him. Yeah. It's I mean, I guess it takes all kinds, but yeah. not my type. Before we deal with the callers, which we must deal with next, mm -hmm. I want to talk about the, the worst thing in this episode. <laughs> okay. Which is the fact that on Poirot's bookshelves, he has Le Mort de Arthur, mm -hmm. but he has following from left to right, book two, then book one. What <gasps> is he doing? Poirot would never do that. What is he's he He's walking around straightening things, and he's not going to put those in the correct order? I was... I was like, I cannot believe those are not in the correct order. That made you twitch. I did. And then he also has the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. Who knows? Maybe there's a reason for it. Maybe he thinks they were published in the wrong order or something. Yes, maybe. So then there is the discussion of the bulldog laundry. Yeah, Poirot's dictating a note. It's the bulldog breed laundry. Yes. <laughs> I know it's racist, but it's so funny. And Hastings' shoes are on the couch again. <laughs> again. <laughs> Mark has problems. <laughs> <sighs> he has the cleanest brogues ever, but you can't stand that they're near the couch. Mere thingness. <laughs> thingness. I love that laundry is in the pay of my enemies. Never considers changing laundries. No. You know there's a gazillion laundries. Yeah. He could take his clothes anywhere, but no, even though he's had to write them many letters and they don't speak English, so he can't actually communicate with them. He sticks with the bulldog breed laundry. But the bo So the boy brings the letters back and Mrs. Lemon <laughs> translates the letter to the boy with the greatest phrase ever. Him collar, no very good starchy. 
No very good spark v- sheets. Very good. Very with v- L's. Very good, good start sheet. sheet. And then she goes, and this is pure comedy. Yes. Well, right? it's it's Hastings who told me that's what I should say. Because Hastings, well, no, no, <laughs> she doesn't say that first. That's the punchline. Because Poirot goes, wait a minute, Hastings went to China. And he's like, yes, they're good chaps. Yeah. And he goes, what? What did you say when you had trouble with laundry there? And he said, well. Him call her no very good starchy. And Mrs. Lemon goes, that's where I got it. Yeah. (laughs) And did it work for you, Hastings? Mm, No. No, it didn't. (laughs) (laughs) This is a confederacy of Dutchess. And Poirot is just like, ah. Man, Hastings says, well, why don't you start wearing these downturn collars? They're all the thing. Paro is not consumed with mere thingness. The thingness. <laughs> and then Jap walks in with the downturn collar. Yeah. And does and he does the most copy thing ever. Well, she's out of it. Yeah. Oh. He's so, he's disappointed that they've had to eliminate Plenderleaf as a suspect. Because she was playing bridge. Playing bridge. What is the difference between Gaspers and Turkish? Gaspers are British cigarettes. Okay. And Turkish are Turkish cigarettes. Okay. I, they smell different, I'm guessing. I guess. So Major Eustace knew her in India. Mm-hmm. And she is behaving like a woman who has been blackmailed. So She's taking money out of the bank in cash, yeah. and it's not there anymore. So Barbara Allen was married Apparently, it wasn't a very good marriage. He died. This is in India. He died. Then she took up with a married man, got pregnant, had the baby. The baby died. Then she came back to England. Yes. And Eustace was in India, so he knew about the affair and about the baby. So this- And clearly, Charles was not going to yeah. have anything to yeah. do with a woman who had been married before and it had a, a, yeah. a child out of wedlock. Because of the blackmail, they search the apartment again. Mm-hmm. And, and find the very suspicious closet. And horrible woman, <laughs> horrible haired woman is like, you can look anywhere. Plenderly. And then has the most awkward scene with Poirot on a couch you could imagine. <laughs> I think she would gets you like him, a though. cigarette from my giant box of cigarettes? Oh, yes. May I also have a lighter, uh, a light from my giant lighter? She gets him, she knows what he's doing, yeah, because she's planted all the evidence, right? So she knows when he's looking around that he wants to sit down, and she knows he wants to sit down to be offered a cigarette so he can compare the cigarettes to the ones in the ashtray that she's put in Alan's bedroom. Yes. She's smart. Oh, she's smart. She's not smart when they ask about the cupboard. And she goes, oh, the key's lost. And I'm like, well, then how did you put your case back in it? Yeah. And then she miraculously finds the key. Yeah. And then I'm wondering, she goes, things get pinched in this neighborhood. So they come into your house. (laughs) And steal your umbrellas. And steal your umbrellas. (laughs) But not all your valuable artwork. Yes. Freddie doesn't want your umbrella. So Jap opens up the case and it's empty except for... Magazines. Amateur photographer. The hole you fell into, obviously, because it's what you do. The amateur photographer and cinematographer. Issue number 53. The journal for everyone with a camera. Now this is Alan's case right no she says it's her case but it's actually barbara allen um yeah barbara allen's case i'm I'm not sure but this sets it in the correct time it's july this issue has some women playing on the front of the magazine playing yeah they're like on a big inner two okay inflatable thing and they're in bathing suits and they're playing and actually there's some fairly decent articles in the issue about how to like frame and take photographs that make them visually interesting see i don't need i don't think plenderleith would need that magazine i don't think so either she's a professional photographer i read the letters to the editor (laughs) Yes, he found the full issue online and perused the whole thing. Uh, No, I didn't peruse the whole thing because it's hundreds of pages. It's (laughs) quite large, actually. (laughs) But the letters to the editor were all incredibly well-researched and very well answered and asked. I was hoping for something. They were technical. I was hoping for the the letters from the History magazine, but no. (laughs) 
I get I get the British History magazine and History, the official magazine of the of the of the <laughs> We joke because they say it in every episode of the podcast. <laughs> The podcast is the podcast of the UK's leading history magazine. Yes. That's so what the they podcast say. Because there's such competition. Yeah. But they have a letters to the editor. I get it because I like history. Mark reads it because he likes the very persnickety letters <laughs> to the editor. And the near impossible. <laughs> crossword. Crossword puzzle. <laughs> When you have a crossword puzzle in a magazine, like say, for instance, amateur photographer, that crossword puzzle is there to promote the magazine. Yes. And it so should be connected should, to the stories in that be issue, right? Connected to the stories in the magazine and be easy. You should be able to answer it if you've read the magazine, not history magazine. Not which one of two pre ice age Inuit tribes in North America. <laughs> what? It's a step up. It's, it's not cryptic, but it is hard. Wow. <laughs> I'm I sorry. have finished one of them and only had to look up like two things. Like I know I only have a minor in history, but uh, wow. <laughs> I asked our historian friend some of the questions and she did not know the answers off the top of her She's head. She's not a super nerd like me. So, But, you know, what Plenderleith is doing is trying to distract them from the golf clubs, right? Yes. Because those are Alan's golf, left-handed golf clubs. And she doesn't want them to know that she was left-handed. The second gayest thing in this episode is the men's pool. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's po Poirot it's a very look, posh place. Looks so uncomfortable. What do you think about men's swimsuits back then? Do you uh, think they would have been more comfortable than trunks? Okay, because they had like straps to hold them up and stuff. No, no, no. trunks are better. I, yes, duh. Well, it's just too much clothes for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> So no shoes on the furniture, but only swim in trunks. No, no. <laughs> you can have shoes indoors. I've admitted that. Okay. Okay. It's not a Canadian thing. Canadians take their shoes off like civilized people when they enter a house. But the rest of the world apparently are no, not civilized. No. Most of Asia doesn't. And most of India doesn't. So they then, take their shoes off. Anyway. So that's okay. But no, it bothers me intensely to put shoes on. Even on the ottoman that's in front of my chair, if I have my shoes on, I don't like putting them on the ottoman. <laughs> Most people, I think, would agree with you in, in theory, but in practice, they just go, eh, whatever. My yeah. shoes aren't that dirty. And I think that Jap is really good at, at dealing with the fiancé here and not making him uncomfortable, but getting the information out of him. Jap has always been good with dealing with upper class people. Yeah. He does not let rich people intimidate him. Yes. The next He's not rude to them just because they're no. wealthy. He treats no. everybody the same. Yeah. The next note I have is, oh no, the song. <laughs> well, before we get to the song, um, Barbara Allen was taking $200 a month out of her account to pay the blackmail. Yeah. $200. 200 pounds. 200 pounds, sorry. Now would be with with uh, inflation would be about 4,500 pounds. Wow. That's what she was paying him. Eustace had her over a barrel. I don't know if that's a lot for blackmail or not. It depends how long she was paying him, I guess. I don't know. I'll have to consult my blackmailing friends. But, you know, Eustace is a manager of a nightclub, I guess. So yeah, it's probably a lot of money for him. He wishes he could own this place. This song okay. is evil. It so, is evil. So it gets in your head. We rarely ban television episodes in the house. But this one. Ah, I wish I could have fast forwarded through this scene. I couldn't because I was taking notes. But I, I wanted to so bad. that this song was in this episode. And this Hindu is the reason why we do stand. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the poor me. woman singing it does a very excellent job of going. They're forcing me to sing this racist <laughs> song. It's the Persian name for India. Yeah. There is still a newspaper called the Hindustan Times in India. It's not Hindustan that I have the problem with. It's the lyrics that I have the problem with. With your camel caravan? Yes. Yeah. There, There is some... Uh, and the waitresses all wear the flat Chinese oh, yes. rice patty hats. Yes. 
and Chong Sams, the silk dresses. Yes. Like, okay, which country are you being racist against? Well, and is it, this China or India or what? And it goes basically da 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 Yeah. At the beginning, like. I'm waiting for Charlie Chan to walk in. Yeah, it's just. Any more racism around? And Eustace is, I like Eustace as a character because, yes, he is blackmailing this woman. Oh, he's despicable, but he's, he's a rat, but that's what he's supposed and to be. a rat, but he does such a good job at doing it. And they arrest him, and he looks honestly shocked. I was just blackmailing her. I wasn't, I didn't murder anybody. Yes. Come on. They go to the golf course. Yes. <laughs> Next to him, collar, no very good starchy. This is my second favorite scene in this episode. So, Sarah, I ask you this. <laughs> You're going to take these golf clubs mm -hmm. to the golf course, which is a good place to hide golf clubs, mm -hmm. right? Because people do break golf clubs. Yep. And I've never been angry enough at the little white ball to break a club. Well, sometimes they just break. Right? I've been close. Especially back then when the they didn't have all the fiberglass kind of stuff. Because sometimes that little ball acts with a mind of its own. Yes. But I never wore my shocking red outfit <laughs> while doing it. You didn't wear your matching sweater vest, sweater, beret, and socks? Yeah. She's like, very I accessorized. I understand that golf is a fashion show that is a long walk. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Especially back then. Especially, especially for women back, back then. then. Especially for women back then. I totally understand that. But she wears the most obvious outfit. Mm -hmm. Like, there's somebody five holes over yeah. in that red outfit. Well, you wanted to wear camo? Something. <laughs> She wears all green. <laughs> well, green would be better. She wears an outfit with a tree printed on it. <laughs> I'm not here. Well, Poirot is not necessarily dressed for golf either. No, he wears what he wears. That's what he always wears. I'm surprised that Hastings isn't in obnoxious plus fours. Yes. The knicker pants. The knicker pants. With argyle socks. So Poirot says, can I hit the flag? Mm -mm. No, you can't. Okay. I got a question about this. Yeah. All right, there's this whole scene where Hastings' friend, who is their host at the golf club, that's why they're allowed to be there, right, yeah. is concerned that Hastings doesn't know how to play golf. And he says, you know, do you are you sure that he's all right? And he says, Poirot is feared at golf clubs all over the world. Yep. And he says, well, do you have a certificate of handicap? And, Hastings, and Poirot says, no, no, I'm fine. Like, yeah. Pretending that's what a handicap is, yeah. right? Here's my question. Is Poro playing dumb or does he really not know about golf? Oh, I think he doesn't know about golf at all. So he just happens to be super good? He Because it's Poro. So it's just luck. Yeah. I love how he scrunches up his face when he goes, can I hit the flag? <laughs> is it okay if I hit it? No. If you hit the flag, it's it's a penalty. Oh, is it? Yeah, you're forfeit that hole. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, you can't hit the flag, man. Don't hit the flag. Uh, who, there's very few people good enough at golf that they could hit it on purpose. I, I can't believe how good his shot is. <laughs> Neither can anyone else except him. Yes. He's like, well, I don't know what's so hard about it. I kind of I, I kind of go back and forth. On one hand, I think, yeah, he really doesn't know anything about golf. And on the other hand, I think he's pulling... Pulling ever so gently the leg of yes. everybody else. But then I think if he was actually good at golf, Hastings would know. Then there's an incredibly sad scene at the mansions, and then they go for lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the ending is a bit rushed here. Yeah. So basically, Plenderleith gets home, sees, sees that Alan is dead, thinks that damn Eustace drove her to it. The letter backs it up. She frames Eustace for the murder, but Poirot's having none of it. He sees right through it. It's and not real hard. And she's really attempting to murder Major Eustace. Then she just leaves. Yes. Just gets up and walks out. Isn't it clever that it's suicide made to look like murder, not murder made to look like suicide? Thank you, Agatha Christie, for speaking in the episode again. And Hastings goes, well, I'm jiggered. Because <laughs> he's completely confused by all but of it. But what about the briefcase? <laughs> it was a red herring. No, it was a bloater, a kipper, anyway, a red herring. let's go for lunch. Yeah, so... Is Eustace going to be charged with blackmail? No. Probably not. Is Plenderleith going to be charged with manipulating a crime scene, lying to the police? She should be. Meddling with a corpse? Probably not. Probably not. Because she just left. So that means she's okay. She's off the hook. She yep. left. 
Case closed. Done. How I I, po- I hope they let Eustace out I hope soon so. after. Like, oh, let him sit there. For he a is bit. a blackmailer who runs a racist restaurant. I'm not <laughs> saying he's a good guy. Okay, I'm not saying he's a good guy. No, but he doesn't really do anything wrong in this episode. No, other than blackmail her, he doesn't do anything wrong. Yeah, <laughs> and run the racist restaurant. Oh well, yeah, he was already doing that. <laughs> And all the other rich guys who hang out in there, they're down with it. So, you know, if he was going to get in trouble with it, he already would have. Yeah. (laughs) It's not the kind of place Charles would go. I can tell you that. I'm surprised they didn't ask her what you would say to a Chinese person about starching collars. (laughs) Or or, Miss Lemon comes in. Um, Excuse me. Can you stop your song for a second? I have a question. Yes. Or (laughs) they asked Chap the question. (laughs) He would have been like, what do you mean starch collars? Laundromat. My wife washes my clothes. Yes. When she's not having any fun. Oh. So that is. It's hard to choose my favorite line from this episode. Him collar no very good starchy is hilarious. Yes. Because of the whole interaction around it. But again, we can't make a t-shirt of that. No. Poirot is, the name Poirot is feared on golf courses across the continent. We could make a t-shirt, but it's not, it's not fun. (laughs) I'm not. Well, I'm jiggered. (laughs) Well, I'm. Poirot is not concerned with thingness. Thingness. Mere thingness. <laughs> yeah, you're not making a t-shirt out of that. Maybe I should make a baffled Hastings t-shirt. Maybe. Like I did with um uh Bracken Reed with all of his quotes. Just yeah. Hastings with Well, I'm jiggered and you're pulling my leg and well, there's all a, the There's a picture you took I of, say. The, of the episode where Hastings is totally staring at the camera. Too. Yes. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'm an actor in this episode. But Hugh Fraser is such a good actor. Hugh Fraser, he's so, so great. Good. But you just want to hug him all the time. And in this episode, I just want to pinch Paro's cheek because he did so cute. Yeah, he's, he's so funny and he's very so cute. cute and funny. Very clever. And it allows us to gloss over the 1989 racism and and the 1930s racism yeah. and misogyny. Yeah, that. Is the non-murder in the muse. Yes. We had a discussion about whether it should be called that or not. There's no murder. But that would give it away. (laughs) The death in the muse. That would give it away. The strange happening in the muse. Maybe you could get away with that. Agatha Christie was clever enough to know that her readers would pick up on that title. If it was death in the muse, they'd go, oh, well, then it's not a murder. I suppose. Next time. Yes, March 4th. We have episode three. The Adventure of Johnny Waverly. It's a good one. I got to say is my least favorite episode. Of this season? Yeah, and maybe the whole series. There's some bits in it. There is some bits. That redeem it. I forget how good it is. Plot wise, it's a little, eh. It's a short story. These are all short stories. It's a bit Keystone Cops with people running over here and then running over here. I kind of like that. Yeah. It's fun. It's super fun. Oh, I love Poirot so much. Yes. I like I like the books. I like the short stories. But man, David Suchet, just mwah, chef's kiss. He's so awesome in every one of them. I never get tired of seeing it. I saw an article this week that said he, over the pandemic, he received three times as many much fan mail as he's ever gotten. Because mm-hmm. people were binging Poirot. Yeah. Because it's a comfort show. Yeah. It's it total, is for me, it's for totally sure. It's a comfort show. I'm like, oh, there's he, there he is. Till we get to the last season, which is incredibly <laughs> depressing. Ah. Oh, well, you know it's there. You don't have to watch it. <laughs> he can't live forever. He has to grow the marrows. Well, and the elephant episode is horrifically sad as well. So let's talk about that at the end of the episode. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Next episode, we get to we get to talk about a spoiled child who's going to be kidnapped. Or is he? Sort of. Maybe. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And then we will follow that up with 4 and 20 Blackbirds, which is fantastic. It has naked bits in it. Mm. Uh, Third Floor Flat, which I love. That's one of my very favorite That's ones. another earworm episode. Yes. Life is just a bowl of cherries. Oh, yes. oh it gets in your head. And sneaking around in the garbage bin. Hindu stand. <laughs> garbage bin staircase. Mm. 
Triangle Roads will remix after that because we did it already and it's fantastic and problem at sea yeah. after that. Oh, fun. I'm so, looking forward to every yeah. one of them. We're going to have a great time. Absolutely. So. All right, maniacs. Until next time. Bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Thanks for joining us on the Mystery Maniacs podcast. If you enjoyed our crazy podcast today, don't miss out on future episodes. Follow us on social media for updates, behind the scenes content, and exclusive sneak peeks. Subscribe, like, and share to spread the word. Bye, maniacs. No, no, but like you'd be as frustrated of, great, I have to cut that out now.